When the Bible talks about the earth being without form and void, what's it really saying? An interesting question, and here to discuss that question with us once again is Dr. Stephen E. Dill. And uh, by the way, he has authored a wonderful book called In the Beginnings. And, and Steve, thanks for coming back and being with us for another uh, session here at Prophecy Watchers. I think your book is a landmark book, and, and like you, it is it's logical. It it's, searches uh, very deeply into history, into uh, the uh, exposition of Scripture. And I, I love the way that you put things together in this book uh, with the idea of giving people a, 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 more, a clearer view of, of salvation. What, what really is salvation? Uh, why did our Lord come to this earth and die? What's the whole background? Well, you've brought a background here in your book, In the Beginnings, and thanks for being with us again. Well, again, it's wonderful to be here. I'm really honored, truly honored. This is a privilege for me. I thank you. Well, we, we appreciate your being here. In the Beginnings, and I want to say that, that uh, Steve has a background <clears throat> in science. You've always been interested in science. Mm -hmm. And you ended up with a career that involved a great, great deal of medical study. So yeah. tell us a little about yourself, and then we'll go, go ahead and talk about your book. Well, I, I was uh, always interested in science. I've always been kind of the science geek, <laughs> even in high school. Um, I didn't go to college. After high school, I went into the Navy. Uh -huh. And it was in the Navy where I became a Christian. I was a theistic evolutionist. Uh, but it wasn't until I was challenged on some of my beliefs about evolution from a scientific perspective that I began to study it seriously from a science point of view. Now, I had not gone to college yet, but I had realized from what I studied, I studied biology books, science books, that there was something wrong with the theory of evolution. It just didn't work. So when I went to college after the Navy, four years, my undergraduate in biology, I uh, majored in uh, biology area of cellular and genetic or cellular and molecular genetics. So I'm a geneticist, I guess. And then after four years of that, I went to a veterinary medical school, which is four years, just like an MD school. Mm -hmm. Four years of veterinary medicine. So in all eight years, I was wanting to discover what science taught about evolution. And so I studied science, the, the genetics especially is what fascinated me. The evidence from science, especially you look at the level of the DNA, the instructions in DNA, the mechanics, the, the computer system, none of that could have evolved by accident. It was all created. And so in eight years of college, everything I learned, while they didn't agree with me, and yet they all tried to convince me that evolution was true, they never present, presented any evidence that was actually basis for ev evolution. Now, having talked with Steve, uh, I, I know about him that he is very, very involved in uh, the gospel. That's why we're here at Prophecy Absolutely. Watchers. We teach Bible prophecy to show people the literalness of the Bible. And, uh, and I believe, Steve, that if you can demonstrate the veracity of Scripture, people will come to Christ. You, yeah. you don't have to go out there and lead them through the gospel. They'll be hungry to receive it if you can show them that it's real. And I think your book is aimed at that. Uh, there's a certain reality to what we see when we uh, look at, at the creation. Uh, in the Bible, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void. The way the Bible starts, it, it speaks very matter-of-factly about the creation. And then it, it goes on to speak of days and nights mm -hmm. and the creation of Adam and Eve. and. Uh, you either believe that or you don't. And some people might say, well, you know, that just sounds like kind of old school superstition to me. I can't really believe in there was a literal Adam and Eve and on and on and on. But systematically, it's the only thing that works. That is, the, the biblical explanation 
is the closest thing to reality that we have. Yeah. Well, again, without form and void in, in Genesis 1 2, what does that mean? Gosh, that's, that's talk about it all day. Yeah. In the beginning, what does that mean? Exactly. There, there are so many different theories of creation that some will say, well, that's the beginning, that's symbolic. Creation is symbolic. My problem is that I want to destroy all these barriers because there are some theories that this is what the Bible says, they'll say, that wind up being opposed to what science reveals. And that may be okay for some people because they want to reject science anyway. But for the most part, when people read something that disagrees with what science reveals, truly reveals, they're going to say, well, the Bible's got it wrong about our origin. Okay, God made a mistake. God's lying. God didn't know. And if he doesn't get the origin right, if we can't trust that, how can we trust him with what it says about our destiny? And so what I've done in this book is I want people to realize that true science, what science truly reveals, and what true Bible, what the Bible truly reveals, not interpretations, are in perfect agreement. There's nothing in all my... I've been a practitioner for 30 years, science, eight years of college. Nothing I've ever seen in science, true science, ever contradicts anything truly revealed in the Bible, and vice versa. I've never seen anything in the Bible that contradicts, there's apparent contradictions, anything truly revealed by science. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want, especially unbelievers, to know. They can trust what the Bible said about our origin. And and by the way, what the Bible says agrees with what we see with our own eyes. If I look out there and uh, I I go down and I purchase a uh, a telescope and maybe maybe I buy a good one. I want to spend $4,000 and get one of those really good, you know, 14 inches or something in my backyard and I go out and look at at galaxies. And wow, you know, the books say that one is uh, 10 million light years away, which means the whole creation must be 10 million years old. Can I actually believe that or is that just an illusion? And I know what I believe, and and I, I think that your belief is the same. You want to uh, read Scripture in such a way that it's in absolute concordance with with what you see in creation. Yeah. Well, again, there are some theories of creation that will say, well, that's just a parent age. God made it look as if that star is that far away. Those are just a parent you know, the, the star was there, created day four, whatever, so the light couldn't have gotten here. It would take millions of years. So God made it appear as if the star was there. My problem with that is, if you look at the six days, if that was apparent, that wasn't really what was there, what else was apparent? When he made birds, were they apparent or were they real? When he made Adam, was he real or apparent? What other things? Okay, the stars weren't really there, only apparent stars were you know, were fish really there? Grass, trees, fruit trees, were they real or apparent? Everything in the Genesis six days were real, literal creations. They weren't just apparent trees, they were real trees. So my interpretation is those are real stars, not just photons of light coming in midstream. So And they were not created in an illusory fashion. No, 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 no. That would make God deceptive. If if God made it look like they were there when they really weren't, to me that's then, then I really can't trust God. So I think the first chapter of Genesis talks about a real what you're seeing is what He had really made. Only it's a restoration of what had been there before, and now He's taking the dark that He'd created and let He didn't destroy the universe. He just made it go dark, at least on Earth. And now He's letting that be seen again. And that, that just makes perfect sense to me. And you know, when I think of creation, I think of John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we learned that the Word took on human flesh, mm-hmm. dwelt among us, and He became our Redeemer. And, and this is the creative force that created the heavens and the earth in the beginning. 
the vastness of all this just takes my breath away when I really put it all together and think this is not an illusion, this is not uh, something that is compacted together in a few thousand years, this is the, the galaxies, the universe, the, 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 uh, the gigantic reality of it all and, and in the middle of it is my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who created all this. <laughs> Again it just takes my breath away to think about these things. And yet when I read, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, it's a, it's a narrative. It's just talking about something that happened. That's a historic event, or events. It, it really happened in time and space. Some people think that's just symbolic of something, that yeah, really, yeah. But, but no, that really happened. So when did it happen? Right. And, and there's a problem with that. You either have to take Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2 as part of the first day because it's not a summary of the creation week because they end with Genesis 1, 2 ends with death and darkness. There's nothing there, it's all dead. Genesis 6 doesn't end that way. So that's not a summary. Some people say that but the summary doesn't agree. So is it part of the first day or did it come before the first day? Mm. And if you look at the pattern in Genesis, there's and God said let that marks the beginning of each day and the evening, the morning, or the whatever day that marks the end. Mm-hmm. For those six days that pattern sets up but Genesis 1-1 doesn't have that. Genesis 1-2 doesn't end that way which implies in the Hebrew, this is what the ancient Hebrews believed that that was a period of time before the six days. Now it doesn't say how long before but Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2 were not part of day 1, they came before day 1. Now, so and, how long? and something caused this destruction. Yeah. That is there, there is a discernible series of events. But before we go into that, uh, I want to go back because you mentioned uh, the ancient Hebrew beliefs in, in, in what you have written in your book. But you, there are also a lot of scholars um, in the last two, three hundred years who have believed and taught mm-hmm. this. And and let's talk about who they are and what they believe. And you mentioned uh, them in your book, In the Beginnings. Well, uh, uh, one misconception is the idea that what I call the gap theory, there's different names for it, ruin restoration, restoration theory. Uh, There's a term I've made called duogenesis, Mm. which I kind of like, but it's not out there. But the idea is there was an original creation of the heavens and the earth, how long that was, a judgment, a destruction, Mm -hmm. and then a restoration. Now that's not something that was created 20 years ago, 30 years years ago. That was believed long ago. Darby believed it. Mm -hmm. Okay, Uh, Schofield believed it. Finnis Dake believed it. Fawcett, Jameson, and Brown believed it. Uh, A.W. Pink believed it. There's a whole list of scholars. In fact, Lewis Berry Chafer. Lewis Berry Chafer, yeah. Yeah. During the 1800s, the, the late 1700s to 1800s, that was, and I've got quotes, people saying this, that was the most prominent interpretation of Genesis. And, and so that's, in fact, so much so that just what they all believe. Spurgeon believed it. He gave a sermon on how the earth was destroyed and restored. Mm. Okay? So it wasn't, it's not a new theory. It's not something brand new. In fact, it's older than what's believed today in a lot of, lot of ways. Um, so it wasn't new. This is not something I created with, came up with. It's not something that uh, Jack created. We're just going back to 100 years ago, before that. Here's what the scholars believed then. Mm-hmm. And here's why they believed it. And so there's a whole long list of scholars. In, in, uh, if you go to uh, uh, the book Without Foreign Void by Arthur Custance, he lists about 80 s- scholars who believe this. And, and one of the things that, uh, for example, when we had Jack Langford here and, and he's written a book on the same subject, uh, uh, he really goes into detail about how, how Hebrew teaching uh, yeah. is, is based upon this idea. Um, Isaiah 14, uh, Jeremiah chapter 4, two prophets who used the terms without form and void yeah in their prophecies. Same identical term you find in Genesis uh, 1, 2. 
And <clears throat> we discover that those terms really mean what they say, without form and void. Absolute chaotic destruction. And not just destruction, but judgment. See, when I say Genesis 1-2, the earth was without form and void, and darkness on the face of the deep, I'm describing a period that God had judged the earth for sin. Something happened and God judged it. There are people who, oh no, that's not true. It just means kind of unfilled, unformed, not created yet. Yeah. But if you look at Isaiah 4, and I mean Isaiah 34 and Jeremiah 4, you will see that they use those same two words in reference to God's judgment. And those are the only place in the Bible they're used. Isaiah is talking about judgment on Edom. He uses those words, tohu and bohu. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah, judging Israel, tohu, bohu. So we got two places in the Bible where God uses those words in reference to judgment. No place else are they used. So if they mean judgment in Isaiah and in Jeremiah, why can't they mean judgment in Genesis 1? I think they do. And then the next question is, why was uh, this judgment brought down upon planet Earth? Well, it wasn't because of Adam. He wasn't there yet. He wasn't there okay. yet. Okay. So in order for him being judged... And by the way, let me just interrupt you sure. right at, at that point and say original sin didn't originate with Adam and Eve. No. No. In, in fact, there's a, different, well, there's a difference between being the first sin on earth and the first sin in the world. The Bible talks about by one man sin entered into the world. That's a different word than earth. Yes. And that's a different point. Okay, that's important. Satan committed the first sin on earth. We, we know in, in the Bible the first sin was when he questioned Eve. Surely you know, he, he's trying to get Eve to sin. When you try to coax someone into sinning, you're sinning. So he asked Eve a question designed to make her doubt God. Right. And then he says, you know, sh the second sin was, surely you won't die. Well, he's lying to her. Yes. Okay, now this is before Adam sinned, but he's in, he's in Eden. So had sin been introduced to the earth? Well, yeah, it's already there. Okay, the third sin, we said, no, it's good for you. You'll, you'll be like God. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the third sin. The fourth sin was Eve took the fruit and ate it. Now that's a sin. She rebelled against God. At that point, was there sin on earth? Yeah, Eve just sinned. There wasn't sin in the world yet. Okay, the fifth sin was when Eve took the fruit and offered it to Adam. When you offer somebody to make them sin, you're sinning. The fifth sin. Now the sixth sin was when Adam ate it. Adam committed the sixth sin on the planet earth. Hmm. Which I find fascinating because the word the, or the number six is often associated with man and with sin. Absolutely. And that may be why. So Adam committed the sixth sin on earth, but the first sin in the world, because the world used is the word cosmos, and that's different, different than geos, meaning earth. And so looking backward, which we do in the Bible, uh, we look back to causality. And we find uh, this formlessness, this chaos that had to be remedied. And the formless, formlessness and chaos was brought about by an enemy of the Creator. Yeah. You, and, we, you, and elsewhere in the Bible we read about him. Yeah, you, you can't have judgment unless there's somebody who sinned that did something wrong. God's, right. you know, if the earth was the earth inanimate object, he wouldn't judge it. Yeah. So that means, that implies there was some sort of intelligent being or beings or civilization that sin rebelled against God that needed to be judged. And the result of that judgment was the destruction of the earth. And Jeremiah talks about that. And so it's a very natural thing for that to have come down into Hebrew teaching. Yes, yes. Uh, they were very wise, mm -hmm. the, the priests of God. And, and in many ways, before their great sins, that they were closer to God than anybody else on mm -hmm. earth, and and they would have been given to understand the history of judgment on this planet, absolutely, and the need for redemption. Yes, and well, uh, and and so they it became a part of their teaching. An important, very important point that many Christians forget is that how the Hebrews interpreted the Hebrew. See, the Bible is written in Hebrew. I say it's yeah. written by Hebrew, in Hebrew, for Hebrews. So if you don't know the Hebrew language and culture, which I don't, it's hard for us to say this is what the Bible means. While they did not have the scientific knowledge we have, 
they had something we don't. They had perfect knowledge of the Hebrew language and culture. We've got professors in seminaries and argue about what this Hebrew word means mm-hmm. and what that Hebrew word means and this Hebrew phrase. They wouldn't have argued. They'd know this is what it means. So how the ancient Hebrews interpreted Genesis ought to be a factor in how we interpret it. And when you look at the ancient Hebrew, yeah. that's something Jack brings out in his book. The most ancient interpretation is that there was a period of time before the first day. And it was without form and void. Now how long was that? I don't know. But it existed before that first day. And if it was tohu vabohu, without form and void, that's describing judgment. And there's a judgment in Jeremiah uh, chapter 4. I just opened my Bible here to Jeremiah 4.23 where Jeremiah says, I beheld the earth and lo it was without form and void in the heavens. Uh, they had and they had no light. And so <clears throat> Jeremiah is using this as an illustration. Mm-hmm. That is to say he, he is given a vision of a, 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 the complete destruction, the chaotic jumble of nothingness as an illustration of God's judgment. And he's speaking to his people Israel when he does this. Yes, he's warning them about judgment. Now, would they have known what he was talking about? Yeah. Why warn them with something they didn't know anything about? <laughs> okay, Obviously they did. When he said without form and void, tohu vabohu, the first place that was mentioned in the Bible was Genesis. That made an instant connection. They, there's no way the Hebrew, could, the Hebrew people could hear the words without form and void and dark and not think of Genesis 1-1. So Jeremiah is warning them with a judgment a similar situation to what God had done before. Mm-hmm. He's telling them, if you don't repent, get back to me, I'm going to destroy you the same way. Except later on he says, but I will not bring you totally, I will not totally destroy you, or full end. So my question is, when did God make the earth without form and void and dark, because he said there was no light, mm-hmm. and dead? What period of time? It is, is that... Is that a picture of the end times? Is When God comes back to the earth, when Jesus returns, is He going to kill everybody and destroy all the cities, make the earth a desolate waste? It's not what the Bible says. It's going to be a restoration. So if Jeremiah sees the earth dead, desolate, dark, judged, it had to be... And no man was alive. And no man was alive. There was no man. So when was there earth with no man? That was before Adam. So he couldn't have been looking into the future. No, he's looking at the past. He's looking into the past. Yeah, and I think the ancient Hebrews would have instantly recognized that. And what he's doing is he's telling them, if you look at Jeremiah, he's going down this list. If you don't do this, I will do this. I will do that to you. I will do this. But at Jeremiah 4.23, he suddenly shifts tense. And the Hebrew has a different way of doing tense. Hmm. It's now no longer what I will do in the past. Look what was, I mean in the future, look what was in the past. This is what was. And he just like, I, I, I beheld and it was. I beheld and it was. There's a list of what's. And then he goes back. That's a parenthesis. He's taking a parenthesis, warning about a past judgment. And then he goes on saying, I, I will do this. So he stops in his warning to Israel. He says, now let me tell you what God's going to do. He's going to do to you what he did to the earth in the past. He's mm-hmm. going to make you dead, desolate, ruined, dark, no man, he's going to destroy Israel, but he won't make a full end. So Jeremiah's looking at the past, not the future. He's not looking at any time since Adam. He's looking at a definable past. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> they but, would have known what he was talking but about. But when was that then? When, when did God make the earth dark, desolate? Only one time Only one we time, know Genesis 1-2. Yeah. Now, here we have then... Uh, if you will, a prophetic rendering of Scripture. Because prophecy does not look uh, just forward. It looks backward along the timeline. Isaiah 46, I created, God said I created the end from the beginning. Absolutely. And and wow, how does that work? And yet yet prophecy takes takes in the entire timeline. And it, it does so for a reason because God has a plan which He reveals to those who follow Him through Christ. And that's what we're doing here. Uh, I think our reasoning 
in having this discussion today, if you happen to be watching and you have not received Christ as your Savior, there is every reason to do so because the Bible declares actuality, the things that have really, really happened. You can believe it. The, the whole idea of ruin restoration, of the earth experiencing a destruction and a restoration is a foreshadow, an image of man's history. We experience sin, death, destruction, and only as Christians do we experience restoration. God restores us. God restored the earth. Paul says God shines light, it's spiritual light, into our hearts. But he said it's the same as when God shined the physical light into the earth. Both of those things are God has to do that. The earth couldn't receive light, couldn't make its own light. We can't make our own spiritual light. God makes light. God restores life. It happened to the earth, it happens to us. And the book is In the Beginnings, plural, and it's by Dr. Stephen E. Dill. <clears throat> he's a man of science. He's, he's got a uh, scientific uh, discipline in his background and a great curiosity, that, by the way, to, to, to put things in a, in, a, in a sensible and logical way. And, and he does a great job in this book, In the Beginnings. Uh, you can find it in our online bookstore at Prophecy Watchers. Uh, just uh, click on the online bookstore, go down to Stephen E. Dill. And by the way, as we do, we're putting uh, this offer into a package. And you'll find it uh, on the on, in the online bookstore under uh, the Ruin and Restoration Package. You know, that's what actually happened. The earth was ruined and it was restored. Uh, S- Steve's book, along with Earth's Earliest Ages by G.H. Pember, and The Gap is Not a Theory by our good friend Jack Langford. <clears throat> These three books uh, form the Ruin and Restoration Package, and you can find them in the online bookstore at Prophecy Watchers. Click on it, scroll down, and you'll find the Ruin and Restoration Package. We put it under that name because that's basically the subject. That's what we're talking about. By the way, you can call the 800 number on your screen uh, right now, and you can order uh, the Ruin and Restoration Package. And believe me, once you begin to read about these things and, and see them click together in logical fashion, it's going to give you more respect for the entire re- process of redemption through Christ than you've ever had before. Well, I wish we had more time. It's, <laughs> it, this, I, we're just getting to the good part and we have to quit. <laughs> Steve, There's thanks so for being with say, us. So much more I'd ask you. I've got questions from you. <laughs> Well, you know, all I can say is keep writing because uh, the, the work you're doing is good and we appreciate it. I thank you again for being here. He's Dr. Stephen E. Dill. You need to read his book and uh, we've, we're giving you the opportunity to do so. I'm Gary Stearman. <clears throat> hey, you keep watching. We are. Thanks for joining us on Prophecy Watchers. You can find us on the web at prophecywatchers.com. In the meantime, keep watching everybody and we'll see you soon.